This demonstration will show how we can measure evapotranspiration, or ET, in plants and soils. Good evening. I'm Dr. Phil Busey, agronomist. Most of my work with plants involves large areas, such as fields and landscapes. But for this demonstration, these small plants growing in one-quart containers are very suitable. Evapotranspiration is the combination of evaporation of water directly from the soil as well as evaporation through the leaves, which is called transpiration. Together, we call them evapotranspiration. This is very important to understand if we're going to efficiently irrigate plants. To start this experiment, I want to make sure that there's enough extra water in the soil to completely fill all the large uh, pores between the soil particles. That's a point which is called saturation. After enough drainage occurs in which the gravitational water will be pulled through the soil, those large pores will return again to being filled with air. And that will be a point that we'll call field capacity. There's five ways that water can enter and exit a soil plant system. One way is by irrigation, such as what I just did. Another is through precipitation in the form of rain or other forms. There are three ways that water can exit. Percolation, which we've seen. Runoff, which occurs when there's so much extra water that the soil can't even absorb it. A horizontal movement of water. And then thirdly, the evapotranspiration, which is what we're trying to measure. To accurately measure evapotranspiration, we must exclude the other four factors. And let's hope it doesn't rain, and let's hope these plants achieve field capacity tomorrow, and then the experiment will begin. I'll see you then. Good morning. It's February 2nd, and the time is 11.13 a.m. Plants have had an opportunity for their soil to drain by gravity, and the soil should now be at approximately field capacity. Plants have been numbered for record keeping purposes. The excess soil has been cleaned off the pots so that there should be relatively little extraneous uh, changes in plant and pot weight. We will now proceed to weigh them. But first, evapotranspiration is extremely important. Evapotranspiration is almost the only reason that humans irrigate plants without which they would often die from drought or they would be unproductive. Transpiration, the part of the evapotranspiration that occurs through the leaves, is actually a di di gaseous diffusion. And it's a requirement or a necessity that is a part of the gaseous diffusion that also occurs through photosynthesis. So we can't stop transpiration, but we can compensate for it by irrigating plants accordingly. Let's weigh. We'll be using gram measurements and we'll tear the uh, balance as necessary. Potted plant one is 696. Tearing to zero. Two is 632. Three is 630. Four is 639. Potted plant five is 638. Six is five four nine. Seven is five eight three. And eight is seven seven six. So those are the starting weights from which we will subtract 
the weight tomorrow and the difference will be evapotranspiration, assuming it doesn't rain or assuming other circumstances do not interfere with this experiment. See you then. Good morning. Today is February 3rd, 2015. The time is 11.51 a.m. In the past approximately 24 hours, plants have sat undisturbed and have had an opportunity for evapotranspiration to occur. There has been no rain. The sky has been moderately cloudy with some patches of sun. There has been a moderate breeze throughout most of the last 24 hours. The weight of plant, soil, pot, and soil water today should represent only changes due to evapotranspiration. We will measure today's weight using a gram balance tearing to zero as appropriate. Plant one, soil, pot, and water are 652 grams. Plant two, 607. Plant three, 558. Five, Plant four, 561. Plant 5, 5, 5, 1. And plant 6, 4, 3, 7. Plant 7, 4, 9, 6. Plant eight, seven, five, three grams. Now that we have our data, how do we interpret it? Well, first we will subtract today's weight of plant, water, soil, and pot from yesterday's to find the total evapotranspiration in an approximately 24-hour period. But there's more to interpretation than knowing the absolute quantity. What we might be interested in, considering that plants differ and have different evapotranspirations, is to see if there's any relative basis for evapotranspiration. Could we divide the uh, evapotranspiration by the leaf area by counting the number of leaves and measuring the area of each leaf? Yes, and that's been done. It's very difficult, and it may not be representative. Because some plants have many leaves on the interior of the canopy where they are less exposed to the factors of the environment, such as wind and sun, there might be less evapotranspiration in there. So how do we take the total plant evapotranspiration and interpret that? Another way that we might be able to do so would be to look at the size of the plant in terms of its height and its width expecting that larger plants will probably have greater evapotranspiration than smaller plants. A third way that I like best because it has a great utility for use in different situations is to find the evapotranspiration on a relative surface area basis in terms of the size of the ground covered. This pot has a diameter of 11.2 centimeters and that would be an accurate estimate of the surface area of the soil. Many plants grow in ecosystems or in fields with other similar or different plants. And to understand the total evapotranspiration of a crop or a forest or a grassland, it'd be nice to express it on a relative basis in terms of surface area. And that's what we'll do. And uh, we'll just have to go inside and do some computation. So I'll see you on the computer. Before looking at the data, what we are doing involving the five ways that water can enter or exit a soil plant system makes sense only when there is a limited plant available water holding capacity. That's true and it's easy to see in a pot, but it's also true in a field area 
where the limited plant available water holding capacity is based upon the characteristics of the soil as well as the depth of the root zone. In our situation, there was no irrigation intentionally. Fortunately, there was no rain or other form of precipitation. Therefore, there was no runoff and no percolation. So everything we measured in terms of the difference of pot weight from one day to another was purely evapotranspiration. The data shows that for plant one, there was 696 grams of total weight on the 2nd of February and 652 grams on the second day. The difference is pure evapotranspiration, 44 grams, or expressed another way as cubic centimeters, since a gram of water is about one cubic centimeter. The data for the other plants can be derived similarly by subtracting the, the second day from the first day. Before getting uh, into um, more detail, I, I went ahead and waited another day before I um, interpreted this and took data on the 4th of February as well. So I had a second set of uh, interval of, of ET, which is expressed here as the difference between the 4th of February subtracted from the 3rd of February. It's expressed as uh, DIF2 or ET2. And this second uh, column of ET data shows that in the second interval, there was actually uh, a pretty similar uh, degree of evapotranspiration on uh, um, uh, the different days. There's much more variation among plants than there is between days. Plant 6 had 112 grams or cubic centimeters of ET in the first interval and, and 104 in the second. It was the highest ET uh, plant pot soil system in either day. Before interpreting why this might be, let's uh, do a little conversion. Instead of looking at the um, e ET or evapotranspiration as cubic centimeters per day, let's divide it by the uh, area of the surface of the pot, 98.5 square centimeters. And since we're dividing a um, uh, three-dimensional quantity by a two-dimensional quantity, the um, result is a one-dimensional quantity, which is centimeters per day, or depth of ET per plant per day. That's what we need to take a look at uh, as, as an index that may be useful in other situations. Why did plants differ in terms of their ET? Well, it may have been because of actual plant differences, or it may have been an artifact of the way the plants were growing. Some were growing well contained within the pot, others uh, tended to reach out over the edge. So the uh, surface area may be uh, uh, an artifactual way of measuring things in a pot, not so in a, in a field area. Looking at the individual plants and their ET on a centimeters per day basis, they differ. Uh, the succulents, the Kalanchoe plant one and the uh, Echeverias plants two and eight had the lowest ET and they also had the shortest heights. Other plants were more intermediate and then one such as plant number six was the Lantana didn't seem to be that tall, but it was sprawling out over the edge of the pot. So there are probably both uh, real biological reasons for differences in ET among plants, and there are also probably some artifacts in expressing uh, ET on a um, area basis, which may not be applicable where you've got a plant extending out over the edge of a container. You to think about that yourself because uh, this experiment was not intended to measure differences among plants. However, it seemed interesting to include different plants in this study. The main point really was to show that ET is a measurable quantity and it's certainly very measurable in a container. We'll continue by looking at uh, plant available water holding capacity and how do we use ET and plant available water holding capacity uh, along with other factors such as rain, to program our irrigation most efficiently and effectively. So I'll see you in another video. Right. Bye-bye.